I want to introduce to the stage our Attorney General here in the state of Colorado, Phil Weiser, for some comments. Bring, come on up, sir. We've got a two-part keynote here, and I am happy to be the warm-up in what is a really great set of conversations. Healthcare issues are a huge priority for all of us here in Colorado. The work that I did in the Obama administration really helped set me on an awareness about these issues. And my work now as your Attorney General is a chance to continue an important set of public policy efforts. I need to acknowledge, just talking to Janet, my wife Heidi Wald, who's really a leader in this area uh, and is someone who I continue to learn from. The work that we will do is very much going to be collaborative. Uh, we in Colorado have a chance to be innovators, to see where the puck is going, to use Wayne Gretzky's famous phrase. And today, I just want to talk about four priorities and then have a little bit of a conversation. First, access to health care and the Affordable Care Act. Second, more affordability. How do we drive down costs? Third, how do we encourage innovation? And finally, what are some big public health challenges and what is our office doing? First, on the Affordable Care Act, here in Colorado, we have 400,000 people who have health care because of the Medicaid expansion. 700,000 people are protected from being discriminated against because they have a pre-existing condition. That's all on the line right now in litigation, and this does feel a little bit surreal, kind of like a bizarro world, where the federal government and our Justice Department is arguing that a law that has been enacted by Congress, upheld by the Supreme Court, is unconstitutional. They're doing so on an extremely novel, one might say uh, deeply flawed theory about if one part of the law is unconstitutional, they argue the whole law should be struck. We in the Colorado Attorney General's Office are defending health care and defending the Affordable Care Act. And I don't want to think about the possibility of losing, both because it is so offensive to me from a rule of law standpoint, but also because the impact on our state, particularly rural hospitals, would be devastating. And instead, I want to make sure we support our rural hospitals as important centers for innovation and access. I got the chance to visit Banner Health's Brush Hospital, which is using telemedicine from a signature uh, facility of theirs in Phoenix where even if you've got really complex issues, they can give you access to health care remotely. And telemedicine is an extraordinary opportunity for our state. So I want us to move forward with more access all across our state, and this lawsuit is critical to enabling that to happen. Let's talk about affordability. It is fair to say the Affordable Care Act provided access through the mechanisms I did, but only really started an ongoing challenge about how do we contain the rising cost of health care. Our governor, our insurance commissioner are doing really important work. I'm not going to uh, get to their uh, leadership, including on this reinsurance program. That's something that Mike Conway and others can talk about. But I want to talk about a few areas we're doing in our office. And first, the price of prescription drugs. For people who've been looking at generic drug prices, asking, this doesn't seem right, some generic drugs have gone up as much as 1,000% over several years. You won't be surprised to hear that we're suing a number of generic drug companies for price fixing and collusion. This behavior is wrong. We're going to hold them accountable and do our part to contain the rising cost of generic drug prices. Another effort is we were charged by the legislature to look at the rising costs to consumers for insulin, which is a life saving drug and has gone up 50% or more in a short period of time. We're charged with analyzing that and reporting back to the legislature and others, what can we do about this real challenge? More than that, we are enforcing the antitrust laws vigorously. One case I would specific, um, specifically call out is involving the uh, merger between United Healthcare and DaVita, which in Colorado Springs was going to threaten competition in the Medicare Advantage market. And we took action by ourselves, without any other states, without the feds, to protect competition and to ensure that Humana, who had been a disruptive entrant, could continue to compete effectively against the dominant player there. That's critical to enabling consumers to benefit from competition. And as I am working as Attorney General, one point I really want to work on and together is how do we address entry barriers so new forms of competition, like Dispatch Health, a company born here in Colorado, are able to provide consumers with more choices, higher quality, and lower prices. Not only do we need more competition, 
and lower cost, we need more innovation in this space. A few points are worth touching on. We are all living in what can be a personal health revolution. If you wear a Fitbit or any number of other devices, you have an ability to monitor your health and wellness in ways that didn't exist in prior generations. More and more companies are encouraging people to monitor and manage their health and wellness. The ability to give people information up front through techniques like open notes is very powerful. That level of communication the internet can provide can tell people, go to the ER, something might be happening, or don't go to the ER for this, an urgent care clinic is fine. We need more interoperability and access to electronic health records to best enable this revolution. That's something that's mandated by HIPAA and something that I believe we've got to keep working towards. It also will help encourage what already is in Colorado, a health innovation ecosystem that can make our startups here the envy of other regions. We have a unique blend of leadership and government, academic institutions, providers, entrepreneurs. So efforts like we have the 10-10-10 challenge are great ways for us to identify challenges and come up with innovative solutions. Finally, as we are innovating in this space, I do have to give the warning on cybersecurity. The fact that we have more connected devices, think the Internet of Things, means we've got more points of vulnerability. So we need to stay vigilant. Our office will continue to provide guidance and leadership. And where people are complacent and indeed actually undermining such protections, they can even be held liable under Colorado law. Finally, I want to close talking a little about public health. When I ran to be attorney general, I wasn't realizing that this job would have so much public health at the center of it. Let me tell you a few ways in which my work and the commitment to supporting the public health are interly connected. First, the opioid epidemic. Hospitals across of our state are seeing this. Jails are seeing this. We have had, up until last year, a 20-year rise on more and more overdose deaths from drugs, mostly opioids. In fact, in 2017, we lost more people to overdose than in the Vietnam War and the Iraq War combined. This is a crisis. And we have to do all we can using multiple tools to solve it. I know the Colorado Hospital Association and others have worked together to cut down on the automatic provision of giving out opioids as freely as I got them when I broke my ribs and got a two-month supply that I never used. I know we're getting the word out about National Take Back Day, which was last Saturday, to return these drugs, because if not, they can end up in the hands of people who then become addicted to them. And we need to hold accountable those pharmaceutical companies who've lied to people, making a bunch of money. We are suing them now, and we will hold them accountable. And what we will do with those funds is make sure that we can support drug treatment, because we only have about 30% of what we need. So that's a little bit on the opioid epidemic. Let me also talk now about vaping, which unfortunately is another epidemic which is getting to our teens. Colorado has the highest rate of youth vaping of any state in the nation. We need to recognize the damage that can come, not just directly from vaping, but also indirectly. People who vape, according to Rise Above Colorado, are 10 times more likely to start using prescription drugs. So this is a challenge on our hands. We want to be engaged in helping to get the word out about this threat. And finally, around mental health. I saw Vincent here from Mental Health Colorado. We are a partner with their great work. We've got to work together to destigmatize mental health work with our colleagues at the uh, insurance division to go after if providers aren't giving parity mental health treatment. It's a real issue because right now not enough teenagers in particular are able to acknowledge challenges they have and get support. And Colorado also has one of the highest rates of teen suicide in the nation. We've got to do this work together. We've got a PSA that we recently released helping to get the word out. The more people are willing to say something or reach out to Safe to Tell, a program run by our office, the more we can save lives. So in short, I believe in Colorado, we can do incredibly important work together, making our healthcare here the most innovative, affordable, accessible, and helping to prevent harms before they happen. But we only do that with the work that we can all do together. We'd welcome a chance to have a few thoughts, questions, and ideas. Thank you all very much.
All right, thank you. Good stuff. Let me start with where you began on the, the, the lawsuit, which I think, yeah, I think a lot of people feel like that's been decided, that's been in, it's been in the past, we sort of, that's politics now, it's not, not really something that we should change our strategic plan for. I don't know about that. It seems like it's got more legs than maybe mainstream non-legal thinking uh, would give it. Well, give us an update on, on, on where that is first and the timeline you think that might uh, unfold before the, assuming it gets to the Supreme Court and, and, and a little more of your legal thoughts on that. So for those who aren't paying attention, the lawsuit challenging the Affordable Care Act in its entirety is a ticking time bomb. It is now at the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Based on the oral argument in the Fifth Circuit, there is a non-trivial chance that the Fifth Circuit invalidates the Affordable Care Act in toto, which means no Medicaid expansion, no protection for people with pre-existing conditions, no requirement that kids are on their parents' health care plans till 26, and a whole lot more all goes down in flames based on, again, like I said, a super sketchy theory that because one provision, this is the mandate provision, could be said to possibly be unconstitutional, the whole law should go down. If the Fifth Circuit does rule that way, it will be an earthquake because then people say, oh my God, is this really happening? And Congress has taken some fairly, again, sketchy positions here themselves. They said, well, we're for the lawsuit winning, but then we'll fix it by legislation right away which the chaos that that would involve, you can just imagine. So what happens? We go to the Supreme Court, we being myself and other state AGs who are defending the law, and we say, please, stop this ruling from going into effect so you can hear this case and make a decision. Depending on when the Fifth Circuit rules, the Supreme Court would take the case this spring, or increasingly likely looking like next fall, and they would then, as a court, decide this critical issue I believe Justice Roberts, who was the swing vote to uphold the law the first time it was at the court, would do so again. But we can't be complacent about this. There is a ton on the line to preserve and protect the Affordable Care Act, and it is among one of the most important things I can do as Attorney General. So on this severability clause, the lack of a severability clause in the ACA, I mean, that's really where they hang the, the, the I guess, the plaintiffs hang their uh, the legal, their legal argument on one clause coming down, the whole thing therefore has to come down. Do you think that there, now, no, again, nobody can know what John Roberts is gonna do, nobody could have known back in uh, 2012, but um, is it possible a middle ground could be to preserve Medicaid and maybe cut out the premium sports in the individual market, or do you think that it's That's not all their argument. Nothing? Their argument is the whole law goes down in flames. The argument that I would say is if you decide the individual mandate is unconstitutional. And just so people understand what happened here, when Congress moved the tax penalty to zero for violating the individual mandate, they allowed for the following argument. Because the tax penalty is zero, the individual mandate is no longer justifiable under the taxation clause, which is the ground that Roberts used to uphold it. My answer is, if it goes down, I, by the way, think there's an argument you can have a tax penalty, but the penalty be zero, but that is an issue only lawyers can love to debate over. <laughs> Put that to one side. The real issue here is, what about the rest of the law? And our position is, even if you did say we're knocking down this individual mandate requirement, I would say the rest of the law can stand on its own. And there had been this severability doctrine that has long said, even if you strike down one part of a law, you leave the rest of the law in place if it makes sense on its own. And to your point, of course the Medicaid expansion makes sense on its own. Congress could have done that on its own. And if you strike it down here, you are doing real violence to the law, to the rule of law, and you're gonna hurt a lot of people who are gonna lose healthcare. Talk to us a little more about um, your approach to, the, to protecting competition, providing oversight to mergers and acquisitions and consolidation. Um, some people, let me first ask sort of a legal philosophy question. Some people would argue that really since the 90s in particular, there's been kind of a erosion of regulatory authority vis-a-vis -vis consolidation. And, and we're now starting to see some 
re-energizing there in the regulatory space, the oversight space. Do you think that that is a fair characterization, that there's kind of a renewed effort uh, uh, nationally to address market consolidation? And, and how do you sort of characterize your philosophy about that vis-a-vis -vis Colorado? One of the risks that you often hear see in the marketplace, you might call it an arms race, where hospitals say they have to consolidate so they can better negotiate with insurers, and insurers say we have to consolidate so we can better deal with increasing consolidation among hospitals. My answer is I want to preserve competition in both markets, the provider side as well as the insurance side. At the end of the Obama administration, where I served in the antitrust division, there were two important lawsuits that stopped consolidation on the insurance side. There also are continuing to be issues on the provider side, as well as the case I talked about was vertical integration. It was a provider getting a hold of, or sorry, it was an insurance company getting a hold of a provider who offered a critical input which could have disadvantaged a rival. We have to keep our eyes on all pieces of that because once you give up on competition, you really lose the best protection consumers can have to get better prices. And whether at some point the eye was taken off the ball, I haven't studied it closely enough. What I can say is that the DOJ and FTC have had their struggles, in some cases, addressing provider consolidation because at times they've had a hard time maintaining a market definition around local markets. So for example, when I was at DOJ in the 90s, we lost a case involving a merger of hospitals on Long Island where the defense was, oh, people can drive to New York City for healthcare. And that was, to my mind, an unfortunate conclusion. And what happened since then is there's been more work done to defend those local markets. Since then, they've won some of those cases. Yeah. You know, in this, <clears throat> in this time where uh, I think nobody thinks Washington, D.C. is terribly efficient, and policy making, uh, with few exceptions, uh, there is sort of gravitational pull to more ambition or more expectation at the state level for policy making. Certainly, we see that in some legislative uh, activity. We saw that in the 2019 legislative session here. But there's also a lot of case law getting written that is fundamentally changing uh, the marketplace. Medicaid expansion is a perfect example in Robert's order. Do you see? So, I, all attorneys in general think that it's part of their job is to defend, of course, the state and the citizens there. Do you also see it as your job in this unique time to help promote interesting case law, help bring uh, challenges to federal action that will change the federal state dynamic as a result in part of DC being less efficient than it could be? Yeah, I'd say four things on this front. First, um, we in Colorado are creative problem solvers. So when we see issues like rising cost of health care in our mountain areas, we get leadership like the reinsurance program you'll hear about. Our office is able to work to help support that effort. That's a great example of we working together in Colorado to solve problems. Number two, at a time when the FTC wasn't on the case involving this merger, we at the Colorado AG's office, we were. And the Colorado Springs Gazette actually wrote up a editorial saying, this is good on the AG's office for being on the case when the federal government failed to do so. Number three, we're going to see a range of issues to protect consumers. You hear about uh, surprise billing and other issues. States are laboratories of democracy that are going to be looking to solve these important issues. And finally, insofar as they're federal issues that we have to ask the feds to be more innovative on, I mentioned electronic health records, we can be there as an advocate for competition and innovation. Tell us a little more about consumer protections and your thoughts about that space. One of the challenges is where consumers are told one thing and have something else happen to them, that brews a lot of upset and cynicism. And so our philosophy is our job is to protect responsible companies who play by the rules and play it straight with consumers. And for companies out there who engage in bait and switch tactics, it's really important that we put an end to it. And we just passed a new consumer protection law last spring that helped close some loopholes that would have protected irresponsible companies who might have been playing games. So I believe effective consumer protection is critical to enabling responsible companies to succeed. Back to the topic of consolidation. Um, 
if the existing and future for an indefinite period of time cost equation on the system side, meaning in some parts of the system like rural hospitals or rural providers, it's just extraordinarily costly. It's very difficult to keep those doors open in many cases. And sometimes a consolidated approach is one that will help keep those doors open. Um, and so as we continue through this market dynamic and policy dynamic that seems to support and catalyze consolidation, uh, where, what is the role of the AG's office on things like price transparency, again, for consumer protection, but maybe to help mitigate potential uh, negative consequences of consolidation. So, you know, post-approval, where is the role of the AG in helping consumers vis-a-vis -a, -vis a consolidated market? We have standalone consumer protection authority, so where a company represents one thing and does another, we have the authority to act. Where there's specific regulatory requirements overseen by, could be Division of Insurance, could be other actors, we often will serve as their lawyers. So as they think we have an enforcement action, we'll often be the lawyers who will work up and on those cases. Mm -hmm. Let me ask just sort of this personal question. Uh, it must be, I guess as a Democratic Attorney General, uh, it, it must be thrilling in the same way a, a Republican Attorney General got to sue President Obama and really rewrote a lot of law at the, at the court level under Obama's term, particularly in the last, uh, last term, second, second uh, term. Do you get a charge on out of taking on uh, President no. Trump? No, it is, it is painful, it is scary, and it's unfortunate. I would like nothing better than to believe that the Department of Justice was operating very much consistent with the rule of law, and that we and that we never had occasion to sue the Department of Justice. I worked at the Department of Justice. There's nothing I'd like more than working with them on issues from healthcare to cybersecurity to antitrust. And the fact that we're in a surreal world where the Department of Justice is arguing the law is unconstitutional in a way that undermines a well-established doctrine is, it's not thrilling, it's just, it's painful. And I do feel that we're doing what we have to do but it's not what I most want to do. Yeah. Phil Weiser, the Attorney General for the State of Colorado, sir, thank you very much for joining us. Thank Let's you. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Appreciate it.